I'm very happy to start off um, and, and thank you. Thank you everyone for having me here today. And so I'm Fawzia Yunis. I am the Director of Communications and Public Diplomacy at the British High Commission. And um, I, I confess uh, right from the outset that this is a subject that I feel really personally passionate about, but it's a subject that which I haven't spoken very often about. And so for me, today's session is also a chance for me to learn, listen, and hear from the experiences of from the other panel members. So please do use this forum as a, as a good sort of ideas exchange. And I really liked your last point, which is around uh, solutions as well, and how we can all work together uh, to try and combat um, this terrible, terrible um, rise that we're seeing in uh, violence against uh, women and girls, especially during this pandemic. So I'm going to start off with, I think, five things in terms of the way that when I was thinking about today's session, there were five things that really came out for me and, um, and, 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 and which I wanted to sort of speak to you all about. And I think, first of all, for me, it's about this is a global issue. You know, this is not confined to uh, Pakistan. It's not confined to the UK. UN Women has uh, called this a shadow pandemic and uh, particularly we've seen a rise uh, for domestic violence against women and girls and, 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 and the global evidence regardless of the pandemic showing that one in three women uh, were experiencing violence at some stage in their lives and, and the global pandemic has, has just sort of exacerbated that a lot more. Um, to give you an example, uh, two examples, so they're saying the UN has said that violence against women and girls has increased by about 20% uh, during the global pandemic. And the other statistic which um, actually horrified me when I was uh, uh, reading up about this was that um, there's a UK charity called Refuge which does brilliant work in the UK and they had a 700% increase in calls to their helpline in one day during the pandemic. So for me, uh, this suggests that this is a global issue and we need global action together to try and address this. Secondly, uh, I, again, I was thinking about the reasons why. Why are we seeing a rise against uh, violence against women and girls uh, during the pandemic? And I think there are a number of reasons for that and uh, you'll have your own ideas as well. So for me, um, during the pandemic, uh, over, half of the UK, over half of the world's population has been living in a lockdown at some point since March, which is a phenomenal uh, am amount of people if you, if you just take a step back. And if somebody said to me this time last year that half of the world's population would be living in some sort of a lockdown uh, this year, I, I, I would have said you've got bananas. But this is where we are, you know, this year, 2020, has been um, a year that has been unprecedented uh, challenges all around the world. And for me, this is about how women and girls, who traditionally should probably feel safe in their homes, how they are uh, probably, in, if you're already being abused, that the worst place for you to be during a lockdown is in your home, right? Because you are isolating yourself often with the abuser. Secondly, you're not able to sort of get out and meet your uh, normal support systems, be they friends, family, your local sort of charities who might be helping and providing you some support through social workers and so on. So not only are you trapped at home uh, with your abuser, you're also unable to access the sort of basic services that you need to try and protect yourself. And then I think the third thing that I've also, I was sort of reflecting on this, and it's a thought that hadn't really occurred to me before, um, was around loss of economic opportunity. So again, uh, during, during the pandemic, we're seeing that many, many countries are only facing a health pandemic, but they're also finding themselves in, um, uh, it, it's an economic pandemic as well with, um, with recessions taking place, a big, big impact around uh, the economy, jobs and so on. And so that means that women who might be able to go out to work, have a bit more independence, uh, be earning a, a living, a wage, um, don't, have, don't have that normal uh, sources of income anymore. 
And I think the final thing that I would say as part of this on, on why this uh, lockdown has impacted uh, women and girls uh, the most is also on the poorest women because the poorest women are often uh, living in very small cramped uh, rooms or houses and, um, and actually there's no room for sort of social distancing and so on. So what I would also say is that um, the, 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 the women who are probably the most vulnerable in our communities from the lowest sort of socioeconomic backgrounds have probably been uh, the most um, impacted by what's happening globally. So what can we do about it? And I know this will come up, this is my third thing, I know that this will come up uh, during the discussion as well, um, but some of the things that I will touch on just over here, so for me it's about women, uh, people supporting other people, women supporting women, um, and raising awareness about how people can get in touch, women can get in touch if there's a, if there's a problem, and uh, some of the campaigns that I was looking at, for example, uh, were around social media, WhatsApp, Instagram, in the Home Office um, in the UK, our Home Office, our Interior Ministry, has uh, launched a campaign called Hashtag You Are Not Alone. Um, in the Middle East, I was uh, watching a documentary the other day where women were banging their um, pans and, and, and basically what that was intended to do was to tell other women who might be uh, facing some sort of domestic violence that their homes were open to them uh, to go in and be a safe, secure place of refuge from, from domestic violence. So I think, you know, there's, there's a number of ways that we can still try to reach out to one another, being kind, being considerate, raising awareness. Um, but I think that, you know, I'd welcome your ideas in terms of what are um, other, other solutions as well. So I think the sort of fourth thing, and I'm sorry I'm catching through because I was told I had like a, a limited amount of time and I want to make sure I sort of covered this, was around... Um, uh, domestic violence, I mean, we, we're, we're, the reason why we're doing the panel session now is because we have the um, 16 days of uh, activism against uh, violence against women and girls. And, and for me, um, one of my pledges we've done um, at the British High Commission, we've been looking at some pledges that women lead, our uh, women leaders uh, have been committing to and, and, and also a lot of our male allies as well. And uh, for me, my own pledge was to support women's leadership, to challenge stereotypes and obstacles that limit this process. So for me, this is about how do we, how do we, um, how do we break down those barriers which prevent women's empowerment so that they're safe from all, all forms of violence. And um, here in Pakistan, the British High Commission has been working really closely with the government of Pakistan and our partners here. And um, some statistics for you, because I'm a fan of statistics. Um, since 2011, eight and a half million girls have benefited from UK supported education programs. Um, around two and a half thousand um, uh, individuals, uh, because we should also remember uh, when we talk, I mean, although today's topic is around um, specifically around women and girls, actually gender based violence can also apply to, to men and boys as well. And um, so in Pakistan, 57% uh, women and girls have directly uh, accessed program supported psychosocial counselling and referral services through UK support over here. We've uh, supported 120,000 women in technical and vocational trades and also um, enabled for nearly half a million women to register to vote and supported um, over, over half a million jobs for women through um, SMEs. So, those are some statistics which I can refer back to, but basically, in short, uh, the, the sort of top headline is that we are working very closely with the government of Pakistan to try and create those um, uh, opportunity, to create opportunity, to create equality, fairness for women and girls in Pakistan. And I think the final thing that I would say, and then before I sort of turn over to you, is that um, I think that um, a lot more needs to be done in this area. You know, we're not there. Um, you know, we need to have transformative change uh, to allow women and girls to have voice, choice and control um, over their lives. And I think that is absolutely 
essential. And um, I think for me, any country uh, that wants to, to, wants to be pr prosperous, uh, you can't do that without 50% of your population not being involved. So what I would say is for me, um, as we're looking at this, it's really important that um, we, uh, the women of Pakistan, and I've met many of them while I've been here in, over the last year and a half, are talented, they're courageous, they're passionate, um, they are full of ideas. And I think, you know, for me, uh, Pakistan can only reach its true potential by making sure that they're involved. And this means empowering uh, gender champions. It includes more women into safe decision-making processes. Um, it means that um, making sure that all women and girls are safe from violence. And um, one final thought from me, and uh, thank you, Danielle, for sort of hosting this at the start. One of the things that I was sort of looking at was at this panel, it's all women. And uh, what we really need to do is to make sure that we also have men involved uh, throughout this process as well, because without uh, men uh, being our allies, uh, we won't be able to see the success that we want to see uh, in this area. So that's a quick canter through. Um, I hope that's been useful. And I hope that that's given uh, folks some uh, ideas to reflect on. And I'm very happy to pick up on any of the things that we've just spoken about. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Thank you, Fuzia. It was really insightful. And uh, you touched upon some really important points. And I would like to follow up on those. And I would also like other panelists to uh, share their thoughts on this. So uh, again, welcome to all the panelists and our viewers. Uh, my name is Danish Khan. Uh, I'm a political economist and I study processes of informal labor from the gender lens in South Asia, in particular Pakistan. And it is my pleasure to moderate this amazing panel and our keynote speaker, Fozia. And uh, before I jump into some specific question, I'd like to introduce everyone. Uh, so you already heard Fozia Yunus, she's a British diplomat and she heads communication and public diplomacy uh, at the British High Commission in Islamabad. And uh, Fozia is also the senior regional communicator responsible for South Asia and co-chair of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, uh, where she is particularly uh, interested in uh, promoting diversity and uh, is a passionate advocate for di diversity and she has won uh, diversity and inclusion award for her efforts in 2019. Then we are joined by Iman Mazari. She is a lawyer and a human rights activist and again very passionate about issues of civil rights and gender rights. Uh, we are also joined by Alina Khan. She works with the United States Institute of Peace and in particular she looks at youth-based initiatives from a gender lens. Uh, we are lucky to join by Khadija Siddiqui. Uh, she's also a barrister and a human rights activist and also a survivor. So we love to hear her thoughts and last but not the least uh, I'm glad that Tuba Sayed has joined us. Uh, she is Secretary of Information of Women's Democratic Front and Avami Workers Party and a, a keen observer and analyst of uh, gender-based issues in, in Pakistan. So as Fuzi already talked about so many points and it's hard to follow after that, but I'll try my best to contextualize this and open floor for other panelists. So I want to start with this a very stark and depressing statistic, and that is one in three women face gender-based violence globally. So as Fuzia mentioned, it is a global issue, but in specifically in Pakistan, it has multiple dimensions. So, and therefore we want, um, our panelists to build on the concrete reality of Pakistan and address this issue. So the first question that I would like to pose to panelists, and again, Fosia, feel free to um, share your thoughts on it. Is it, is there an awareness in society at large about this issue, right? So are we first aware as a society whether gender-based violence is a major crisis and how does COVID-19 has exacerbated it, right? So uh, I'll first go to uh, Iman 
if uh, you would like to share your thoughts. Thank you. So I think uh, starting with uh, how how aware we are uh, in society of gender-based violence and the patterns around gender-based violence, I think the major issue stems from the fact that even though uh, we have legislation in place protecting against it, we have uh, mechanisms in place protecting against it, there is very much a lack of awareness on the issue. So for example, even when there are uh, different forms of violence that women face and they go to report it, uh, often they're not allowed to report or the police officers refuse to register an FIR. So in those cases, there are provisions under the law, but people are not aware of them. Uh, so definitely there is a lack of awareness and I think what happened as a result of COVID was that um, with respect to any sort of crisis, let alone a health crisis, um, women would be and other marginalized groups would be disproportionately affected. So what we saw was we heard of a lot of cases where, and we're not just talking here about intimate partner violence or about spousal violence, we're talking about fathers beating their daughters, we're talking about brothers beating their sisters, we're talking about beating uh, as wives. It's this sort of a context as well. Um, and in those situations, obviously, when you had a pandemic and there was a lockdown uh, and access to health facilities was restricted, uh, access to legal services was restricted. So that did create a situation for many women and young girls where they felt trapped. Um, and as far as what we can also do about that is one, uh, with respect to awareness, I think the state um, and successive governments have not done a good job at raising awareness, especially in uh, rural areas, regarding what mechanisms and laws are available for women if they do find themselves in these situations. And then, of course, another issue is uh, that another solution would be to this. Um, when the government is designing, for example, we expanded the uh, SAS program when this pandemic began, but we also need to incorporate a gender perspective into any sort of stimulus package, any sort of package of social welfare, because at this time, we're not incorporating that perspective when designing these packages. Okay, thank you. And, and again, uh, I'm glad you touched upon some policy recommendations, and I'll come to those uh, in a minute. Um, next, I'd like to go to Alina and would like her to share her thoughts, and especially her experiences in terms of uh, working with youth-based initiatives and how that uh, gender-based violence understanding is among young women in Pakistan. Thank you, Danish. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, in terms of the level of awareness when it comes to laws that protect men and women from violence and the different avenues that are available to women who are experiencing violence, I'm actually going to quote some stat uh, interesting statistics from uh, the International Men and Gender Equality Survey Pakistan, which was conducted by Rutgers Pakistan in collaboration with Population Council, uh, Rosen and Ministry of Human Rights in 2018. Uh, according to the survey, awareness regarding policies and laws for women rights uh, is uh, drastically low among both men and women. Less than 40% men and women have ever been exposed to any public service message on television or any advertisement uh, related to gender-based violence or uh, any, any uh, public service message which questions the use of, of violence against women. And less than 10% men and women have ever heard of campaigns or activities on gender-based violence in their community or workplace. Uh, this this is a very uh, pressing concern, considering uh, that you know, uh, in in terms of the, no matter how many federal or provincial laws we have in place to protect uh, men and women from violence, given the you know the low levels of awareness, there's only so much we can hope to do. Uh, there's not only a need to spread awareness uh, about these laws and the avenues uh, that such as uh, helplines uh, available to women experiencing violence but also adopting a national as well as a hyper local approach for advocacy and 
and thinking of creative ways to reach the most vulnerable population, which is also least likely to have access to mainstream mediums uh, like social media and, and the internet. Thanks, Alina. Uh, next, I would like to go to Khadija and as a woman barrister practicing in Pakistan. So you see this issue not just from a gender lens, but also from the legal lens. So um, can you talk about some legal bottlenecks that may exist in terms of um, how gender based violence is conceptualized among legal fraternity in Pakistan, as well as we know the most judges are men in Pakistan. Um, yes, actually, this is something, uh, a very, very pressing issue, especially in our legal fraternity. If we talk about uh, the ratio of female judges in the high court, there are only six female judges out of 122 judges, and there's no female Supreme Court um, judge till date uh, that we have in Pakistan. So if we compare the statistics to our neighboring countries in Bangladesh, we have, I think, around 12 to 13 female Supreme Court judges. And in India also, I guess we have three female Supreme Court judges. So in terms of ratios, yes, women representation is lacking in Pakistan, especially in the fraternity. But apart from that, what women face, what female lawyers face um, when they go on field and when they practice um, on field, that's completely a different thing because when I go or when my female colleagues go, you know, what we have to face in court is um, something that we cannot even describe, you know, because men will never probably understand how it feels being fully dressed, but still being stared to as if, you know, you're some sort of alien or some sort of different creature coming to court. So, you know, when we go to court to represent our client, we are treated in a way as if, you know, even though even though now situation is getting better, but in the lower courts, it is it is actually worse. We can't even imagine when, you know, we go to court and, you know, we represent our client. But what the first reaction that we, you know, we have to see is that, you know, men are staring at us and, you know, we get different looks. We, the treatment that we get sometimes from the, even from the judges and from our male um, male lawyers, male, co male colleagues is also very discriminatory and sometimes demeaning remarks. We are, we are actually thrown with this demeaning and discriminatory remarks from the male allies and sometimes also from the judges, you know, which actually disempowers us and sometimes it does demotivate us and which is very true actually and you know this is something that we've been facing but there's a long way to go i think more and more females they do need to come and be part of this uh, fraternity and you know start practicing in the legal field so that you know this discrimination and this uh, i think this is also one sort of gender violence, you know, being constantly stared at, you know, be, being given um, unwanted stares. So yes, this is something that is a, a major issue in our um, fraternity, which law young lawyers have to face, especially female lawyers. Thank you. And, and again, I'll, I'll come back to Iman as well, because she's also a lawyer and practices that. So, but before I do that, I like to go to Tuba and uh, because you work at the grassroots level and uh, you engage with folks uh, uh, who not just working class people but also uh, folks work in, in slums as well. So um, how do you see from your grounded understanding of this issue like uh, what are the some major bottlenecks in this regard in terms of raising awareness about gender-based violence? Um, thank you very much, Danish. I would like to thank you and, and you and India for calling me here to speak on this really pressing issue. Um, I would like to start with the point that I don't think there's enough law and legislation around gender-based violence, especially when it comes to intimate partner violence or spousal violence. Um, it's, it's rather strange that in our country, women are treated as second citizens because um, when you look at the situation of the law, if somebody um, is perpetuating violence against your body outside the house, it's always a crime. But when it happens to women inside the house, it's not always a crime and not especially throughout Pakistan. So I think that that is something we really need to think about how we're dealing with women 
in public and private spheres and how their rights and their bodily autonomy differs when they're in the public sphere and when they're in the private sphere. So a woman is a citizen when it, she is in the public sphere, but she's not a citizen of the state when she's in the private sphere. So I do think that that is one thing which makes a very big change in terms of how the domestic violence is taken in the country um, because it's seen as someone which happens in the private sphere, so it's a private affair. So a woman becomes not a citizen, but just a woman and a woman of the house when she's inside the house. So definitely, I think that is how the state uh, is in one way or the other saying that, you know, it's okay for women to be in for violence to be inflicted on women. And I also think that uh, when we come specifically to gender-based violence during COVID, one thing is that when the economy goes down, when there's inflation, working class men or middle class men, when they go out in, in, in these economic situations, there's a lot of emasculation which happens in the society. When you go out, you cannot earn, so you feel less of a man. The only way to realize your masculinity, the only way to live live your manhood is by exercising power on the women who are inside the house. So it's very, um, you know, what, why, why violence against women increases during crisis is because, because of the economic crisis and how men relate to the economy in that moment. And that's exactly what has happened, happened in COVID-19. Unless gender-based violence is not something you can just directly address. It has to be addressed from an economic lens. It has to be addressed uh, from a lens of you know, understanding where your society stands at that particular point. And I think what's happening with COVID-19 is because of that economic impact, the emasculation that the men are going through, it ends up you know, taking the form of gender-based violence against women inside the homes. Um, I also um, believe that it's, it's the gender norms which exist in our society cannot um, merely be addressed through a policy or a law. It requires a deep commitment at the national level from the premier office uh, to bring an end to this. And uh, sadly, Pakistan is one of the few countries in the world which did not declare services for gender-based violence an essential service during COVID. Um, I, I really appreciate that there was some work done but sadly, that was not enough. That was not enough. I'm currently also, because I'm also a health worker and professional, so I'm also working um, with a couple of international agencies and in developing um, a gender-based violence toolkit for healthcare workers, especially during COVID. And I've spoken to a lot of doctors and uh, healthcare workers and professionals across the country and, and, the, and also the survivors. The, the referral system um, is so weak that even when a victim of gender-based violence or a survivor reaches a health center facility, there's no place where they can refer them. There are not enough lawyers who are willing to take up the case. There are not enough shelters. There are not enough crisis centers. Um, there's not enough women police stations or trained uh, police officers to deal with these cases. So what the victim goes through or the survivor goes through actually becomes worse once they try to address what has happened to them. That makes their misery even more uh, horrible. So I, I do think that um, we, we need changes at different levels, whether it is to understand gender-based violence as, a, as, as an issue of public health and to understand gender-based violence during crisis and as an issue of economy, um, I do think that we, we need to look at it uh, from a much broader perspective, which includes different aspects of where the society stands in that particular point. And of course, culture, religion, uh, your personal beliefs play a big, big role in this, which is something we really need to address. We also need to, um, we need to have not just men, but people from religious communities to come forward and talk about this, because I think that is some, something which we're greatly lacking in. I mean, in KP, the reason we don't have, uh, gender-based violence is not criminalized in Pakistan, especially when it's an intimate partner doing it. So, I mean, unless uh, we get the, you know, the religious leaders to get involved in this, not just men as allies, but all institutions which exist in a society and act under the state. I don't think it's possible to address this issue. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You touched upon some really great points and I'd like to uh, uh, other panelists to also uh, share their thoughts on it. But if I may go to Fosia, um, if, if she's available, uh, Yes, I am. I was listening intently uh, to the discussion and, and, and 
And that, I think I called you Daniel before, so I'm really sorry, uh, Danish, um, no. slip of the tongue, so I'm sorry. Um, so two things that uh, struck out for me when I was listening in uh, to this um, brilliant panel and uh, you know, really insightful. As I say, I'm a British diplomat in Pakistan and I'm here to learn and listen. Uh, two things. One is, um, I think it's really important that we don't look at it just from a Pakistan prism. So I'm looking at it more from a global UK angle. And I think that there are things that we could do to join up and, and, and learn from best practice elsewhere. So, um, for example, in the UK, um, the campaign that I talked about, uh, the, the sort of the legislations that we have in place, um, the, there was a letter that was written to our Home Secretary by various charities talking about the rise um, in violence against women and girls. So I think I would, what I would love to see is more synergy of ideas and it just doesn't have to be in the UK but there's other countries which are also uh, working on on similar issues and and so don't make it just a Pakistani specific issue although I know that uh, that's an area of, um, of, of of priority think about how you can learn from from other women uh, who are also working on the same issues uh, globally and number two is about privilege and um, this is something that I am personally quite passionate about and uh, as you mentioned Danish at the start I've done a lot of work in the UK around diversity and I'm a woman of colour I am British and uh, that means that I have had certain personal obstacles in my own life and I've tried to get to where I am today but one of the things I've been quite conscious about is my privilege right so I've got a certain passport, I've got a certain education, I've got a certain income, um, I've got certain, I speak English, all of these things give me privilege and, and, and actually when, when all of us were talking I think this also means us having quite an uncomfortable conversation with ourselves because in a way we all have that privilege where we've all been to decent schools which uh, in which you know were in the English medium and so on but actually a lot of the women that we're talking about um, are probably not part of this conversation today. You know, they will be speaking Urdu, or they would, they might not have even gone to the schools, uh, or would have had any of the same sort of privilege that we that we've had in our own lives. So, how do we include include them in this conversation? And that means us having quite uncomfortable conversations with ourselves about who we are and our own identity. Again, thank you for. Uh highlighting this really important point and um and i totally agree you you really uh, hit the nail here like it is it is a broader issue but but as a political economist when i look at uh, data on pakistan uh, one interesting fact that i see that is uh, the class privilege is there but the gender based discrimination is across classes right so it's not just an issue with folks with low income or folks with middle income, that gender discrimination is prevalent among high income households in Pakistan. It's just a different manifestation uh, exists. So, but of course, it's the working class of women and in particular working class families who are more vulnerable uh, to, to gender-based violence. So, uh, and again, uh, the points that Fosia has raised uh, Iman, feel free to address those or also bring your legal lens and as your human rights activist lens to address this. So I just want to give a, a little bit of an overview of the sorts of uh, uh, cases that I was dealing with when COVID started. Um, we had a lot of cases coming in where um, women were fighting for a divorce or for khula or for maintenance for their kids. And in those cases, what would happen would be that you would go to the court, you would get a court order, which would also perhaps include a restraining order. But when this person, when the husband would enter the home again, in violation of that court order, when we call the police, the police would refuse to intervene. They would say, this is not, this is a family matter. This is an internal matter. Therefore, we are not going to intervene. So this is another really big problem that we do see that often, even when you're able to get the court orders, there's a lack of cooperation from the police. Um, and the police are tasked primarily with protecting uh, communities. So we also need a shift in our policing approach because it has to be modeled along community policing approach rather than the approach that is currently taken. 
Uh, the other thing that I want to raise, because Khadija actually raised some very important points uh, that female lawyers, because ultimately a lot of women who face domestic violence or any form of gender-based violence, they look for female lawyers, right? And therefore, we need to ensure that uh, the field of law is a safe and enabling place for women to practice, whereas it's not at this present time. So as she mentioned, I don't want to repeat it because she did a good job addressing all of those things in court, uh, what we face from our male colleagues, what we hear from judges. Um, and then obviously that also, when, when fe our female clients who have come to us see that, um, they're disheartened by that right so it's it's a it has an effect both ways um and then another point that i want to raise is that uh, already again brought up by khadija was that you need more female representation in the judiciary i cannot emphasize this enough um we do not have enough female judges and i understand why we also don't because when you go into the kacheri and see how female judges are even treated um, it makes perfect sense why a lot of women don't want to enter this profession. And ultimately, till you have female judges and female judicial officers, um, you will not have a female friendly uh, or female perspective incorporated into the law. So one of the major issues that remains to be addressed, and especially in COVID, what, what, because we've seen that crises of this nature have a disproportionate impact on women, uh, this is something that does need to be expedited. And in this regard, we had actually prepared over 1,800 women across Pakistan had come forward and prepared a charge of demands uh, in which we had said that we need expedited inclusion of females in the judiciary, females in the medical legal profession, females in police service. Um, and again, these are things. All right. Uh, thank you, Iman. So next, if, if I move to Alina and uh, I would uh, I would be uh, love to hear your thoughts on the causal mechanisms that you see in terms of how COVID has exacerbated the the gender based violence and given that you work with uh, public universities across Pakistan so there again maybe those stereotypical uh, liberal elites don't go there, right? So what the Fozia raised that point. So how do you see that issue playing out in public universities in Pakistan? Thank you, Danish. So I'm actually going to build a little on what you said earlier about how gender-based discrimination is pervasive across socioeconomic groups and also uh, what Tuba said, you know, how, how we need to look at gender-based violence from a broader perspective. Uh, for me personally, unless and until we talk about gender inequality and, and gender, the gender mindsets that drive that gender inequality, whether that's uh, in terms of, you know, representation within judiciary, within law that Ivan and Khadija talked about, uh, or that, you know, uh, economic empowerment of women or educational attainment or, uh, you know, political participation and, and representation within your democratic institutions. So this is a multifaceted, uh, complex issue and just focusing on gender-based violence is sort of not really addressing the elephant in the room, which is gender inequality and the gender mindsets that drive that uh, gender inequality. And while short-term solutions like awareness campaigns, you know, increasing service avail uh, availability and funding of shelters, uh, legal aid, psychological help, these are essential, uh, you know, to sort of meet this, these challenges in the short term, we need more sophisticated, uh, multifaceted thinking uh, in, in, to you know address uh, th this in the long term through through long term solutions of you know meeting gender gaps in education economy decision making uh, and and you know uh, the the justice system the, the legal system and and uh, politics and we we can't really hope to do that unless we address uh, gender mindset among both men and women, by the way, because 
these the gender inequitable attitudes are as pervasive among women as they are uh, among men so you know unless and until we we address these gen gender inequitable attitudes by fostering peaceful masculinity, uh, masculinity uh, and and empowered femininity all we can really hope to be doing is you know uh, be in a fire fighting situation where where we're just uh, fire fighting gender based violence as it happens instead of you know thinking of long term solutions to prevent it from happening again it's really insightful and great points and thank you for bringing out um, this key point about gender inequality which is the underlying factor that perpetuates gender based violence and and building on this theme i'd like to go to khadija next and uh, again feel free to uh, add anything that you like but uh, if you can address this issue like what are some legal aspects of this inherent gender based inequality in pakistan and again uh, if you allow me to intervene here the, the gender based inequality cannot be only addressed through economic means which is again an important mean but also cultural ideological and other factors also play an important role and same is true with legal framework so can, can you please shed some light on that absolutely um firstly i think our fellow panelists it's a very power packed session and i think the female panelists have done a very good job in addressing the main issues so coming to the legal um the legal aspect of this entire issue there are it's actually multifaceted because there are some issues there are some laws which the general public is not even aware of so you know um like the restraining order that iman has talked about i mean majority of women who do face domestic violence firstly they're not aware what legal remedies they can actually avail so they have several we have the ministry of human rights helpline we have other helplines which are from the pcsw the punjab commission on the status of women we have so many helplines which do cater to women who are facing domestic violence on a daily basis so the issue has risen during covid days because initially before covid the the ratio of the cases of domestic violence they were low and why were they low because the, mostly the males males would be at their work and they would not be at home so you know the ratio of violence was relatively low and they would talk about it to to, to women of their own family and they would you know basically just um, let go of it or you know not give it much heed because it would happen at night time and they would not report about it but when it started but when men start staying at home and when they start spending more time at home they start becoming more violent and this issue actually did rise a lot of drastic in rows so you know the main problem here is that when we hear when we as not as lawyers but when we as humans when we hear about some story of violence the first step that we should take is to lend support to tell that female to tell that person that look you are not alone in this we stand with you in solidarity and this is the step that we can now take to you know help you out of this situation so you know telling women that you know we are with you and we will do whatever we can possibly to help you out of the situation is very important secondly awareness to be aware of the laws that this is what you can do this is the help then that you can you know dialing 15 and then not being able to get what you want like iman just highlighted very nicely that you know uh, women who do um, contact police and their the firs are not registered and they they're usually shocked off shocked off that you know this is just um, something related to your home and it's a domestic issue it's not a criminal act so that's something that you know this hardens women and they do not prefer reporting the crime to police so this is something that you know that needs to be tackled on um, on a, on a national level that these are the issues that women do face and they need to be taken seriously they need to be tackled on an on a national 
uh, regime so that you know women they do feel confident and they know that you know when something wrong is happening to them they will be listened their issues will be tackled and they will be helped out of their domestic or any violent situation like in my case i remember when when i was attacked and when i was going to court and when i was fighting my case there were so many you know this uh, patriarchal mindset which is prevalent in our society and was so deeply embedded that um, i had to hear all sorts of you know insinuations that oh so you were attacked so you must have done something wrong why did that attacker attack you in the first place or, you know so these taglines that are constantly revolving around you that you know something wrong happens to you you are at fault you must have done something wrong so, you know these conversations need to be more openly discussed that, you know this is the issue this is the crime that has happened and you know in, instead of digging into the fact that why it happened it shouldn't have happened in the first place you actually talk about that this is the punishment for this crime and this is how it needs to be dealt in the same way so you know the the reason why crimes do happen in our country is because the perpetrators they know for sure that they will get away there will be some loophole in the law that will help them escape and this is why they do perpetrate crimes and they do continue with impunity and they actually do get saved some way or the other unfortunately thank you khadija for sharing this and again i'll pick on this uh, as as we know the patriarchy is is the underlying cause and it is not just men who subscribe to patriarchy but it's also women who also subscribe to patriarchal norms so uh, as as we know any prevailing system um, does not just use coercion but it also builds consent right that's a major gramscian thought where it's the dialectic of coercion and consent that collectively reproduces a system and in this case that system is patriarchy so uh, coming to youtube uh, building on this um, because you work in grassroots um, both with men and women uh, how do you see uh addressing this issue of patriarchy among both men and women and what challenges you face and how we as a society collectively um be better in addressing this issue i mean i think um what's happened in our case is that we've talked uh we generally i'm i'm not talking about this panel but generally we talk about gender from a very non local perspective how patriarchy functions in a country like pakistan and how it functions in let's say a country in europe is is very different we live in a and there's a theorist denise candioti and she talks about this that in a classical patriarchal setting like ours the patriarchy is not about a man against a woman it is about a classical patriarchal setting where not all men are powerful and not all women are disempowered and women along the way make a lot of patriarchal bargains which is why patriarchal bar bargains in terms of that okay now i will deal with this violence or this inequality or this discrimination because i will be rewarded at a later stage in my life so i think that 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 is how patriarchy is rewarding for some women who actually uh, comply with the norms of you know pa patriarchal society so i do think that we also need to theorize patriarchy in our own context in order to understand why certain issues happen and how we can tackle them so i definitely think that when it comes to addressing issues of patriarchal violence or generally patriarchal discrimination we need a more wholesome and transformational approach which is more than just about crime and punishment um for for me it's also about rehabilitating the society it for me it's also about reformation because i i i don't particularly believe that people are inherently evil hence the inflict violence i believe it is because of the existing norms and values that people you know inflict violence whether and violence acts in our society violence acts acts as a continuum it doesn't exist in one form and not the other i mean it exists in the form of harassment in forms of assault in forms of rape in forms of you know uh, discrimination which iman and um uh, khatija have talked about you know whether it's in the legal community or generally in the society so i definitely think that there needs to be more community engagement um and of course like we cannot call um, i mean domestic violence is not a crime in pakistan 
Um, we have protectionist approach towards violence against women. And I wouldn't say that I'm so against it because I do realize that in our perspective, a lot of the women do not want to leave their husband, especially with the communities I work with. They do not want a divorce. The women do not ask for a divorce. They want the violence to stop, you know? And, and of course there are various reasons why they don't want to divorce. So I, I do think that how, how do you address an issue where the woman doesn't want a restraining order? where the woman doesn't want to leave a house. How do you, ish, how do you address this? So it, it can only happen when, when the focus is a, is a transformational change in the society, which is brought not from you know, top down, of course it needs a top down, but also a bottom up approach where you communicate with the communities and work with the communities. Sadly, we don't, we don't work on heads like that. We don't have a community healthcare system, usually in most communities. I will give you the example of Cuba, for example. Cuba has a community healthcare system, which is a public healthcare system, and the doctors and the professionals and the people who are dealing with these issues are based in the community. They understand the community. They understand the local dynamics. They understand the people. So they're trusted. They're also seen as local leaders. Unfortunately, in Pakistan, we don't, we don't have that. There's a doctor who's probably, um, you know, who's from Quetta, but is posted all the way let's say in Gavadar. Uh, for me, that does not make sense. Why can't we empower people from within the communities to deal with these issues? And I think that that is the kind of approach which, was, which will work best for us. And I think one of the panelists, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting, but somebody brought this up that we have to deal with it locally as well as nationally. So I think at the local level, inside the communities, there's no work being done. We cannot, we cannot say the, that the NGOs are going to come and they will, you know, do this or that. There are a lot of initiatives and very good initiatives that the uh, civil society organizations or the NGOs are doing. But there needs to be a solid commitment from the state of Pakistan, uh, which seems to be greatly lacking at this point. There seems to be a commitment to address this. There needs to be a national conference on the issue of women. There needs to be a parliamentary session, a National Assembly session on the issue of violence against women, which I think has never happened in the history of this country, which is very surprising, given that this is one of the things which affects the more than half of the population of this country, not just women, but also children, also young, young boys. So I, I do think that we, we need to look at it as, as an issue which, which is prevailing in the communities and how to deal it within the communities instead of expecting those women to come to the courts, present their case, and then go through the entire process of you know, dealing with the case of violence, explaining themselves. That process is really, really difficult. And not everybody have access to that. I mean, it's, it's possible in cities like we have lawyers like Iman here. We have other lawyers who are willing to take up these cases. But we don't have that at every district level. I mean, it's only possible in urban centers where we have, you know, women lawyers who, who identify, let's say, as feminist or as gender activists. So it, it's possible in, in those areas, but it's not possible throughout the country. So it, there needs to be something which, which, which involves working with these communities at the community level, instead of expecting women to come out of those communities, to leave their homes and, you know, to address it themselves. So I think what happens in our context is that we place the burden of justice on the women, on the survivors themselves. I mean, if you want to get justice, you have to work for it, not the state. The state is not going to provide you justice. You have to be efficient enough, be resourceful enough, be brave enough, be courageous enough to be able to get justice. And I think that is what needs to be changed. It is not, the onus should not be on the person who's dealing with this kind of violence, who's dealing with this kind of uh, discrimination to get justice for themselves. Thank you, Tuba, and, and you raised some really great points. And if I can go to Fosia and uh, and get her thoughts on this, and in, in particular, if you can talk about some initiatives, because you mentioned um, the 16 days of activism, uh, if, if if I'm not mistaken. Uh, uh, so how how you see what are the some potential avenues to uh, to improve the situation? Uh, thank you, uh, and thank you. It's Danish and all the other panelists. I mean, it's uh, I'm learning a lot this afternoon. Uh, so uh, thank you for being so frank and so honest and uh, sharing your challenges across. Uh, if I can reflect on two things, and this is very much learning from my own personal experience. If I take off my hat of being a diplomat, if I if I put on my hat, uh, uh, as you said at the start, Danish, I've been doing a lot of work around diversity uh, in the UK and trying to open up 
uh, opportunity for all, for all women. I think number one, what I would say is um, you need to represent all women. And we've talked about local, we've talked about national, we've talked about global. Um, but I'm very conscious in the conversation that we're, we're having today, and I completely understand your point around um, uh, this being uh, an issue that affects all, um, uh, all uh, social classes. Uh, but what I would argue is uh, that, uh, for example, some of my own experiences in the UK is around access. So if you're looking at campaigns, if you're looking at access to legal services, if you're looking at uh, somebody putting something out on WhatsApp or Instagram or something of the sort to say, you know, this is how you can help. Very often, so the, the women who are in, um, in a certain social class will be able to access those services, or women who don't have access to those services are not on the internet, uh, are not speaking English, uh, don't have the privilege of being able to access those um, connections through whether it's legal or whether it's um, uh, talking, uh, healthcare, whatever it is. How are you reaching out to those women and how are you enabling them to get the support that they need? Um, so that's sort of uh, the, the, the sort of first thing that I would say. So, yes, it's, it's an issue that affects all women. But I, what I would argue is that there is a discrepancy in how those women and girls are able to access the services that we've been talking about today. Um, and then the second thing I think is that it's really important and, and, and it's something for me, uh, which I take away personally when I was co-leading the Foreign Office's race network uh, with my colleague Muna. And um, one of the things I learned is that you need to take the anger out. And, uh, and, and, and it's, it's really hard to do that because, you know, when I was thinking about racism um, in, in, in the UK society, it's something that I get very passionate about. And, um, it's, it's, you know, and it's really hard to take that emotion out of the conversations that you're having. And, um, and some of the work that we did was to try and uh, look at how we were making our arguments. And so we looked at qualitative um, lived experiences of staff, you know, thinking about, you know, if you've been um, subject to a racist incident, what that feels like and actually validating that and saying, you know, this is true to you, so we accept that. And then we looked at um, quantitative analysis as well, which is really looking at the data and uh, thinking through, uh, you know, what are the incidents of uh, racism, uh, both in our workforce, but more broadly as well. And um, I think on both accounts, I think what would be really useful, and I don't know if it's been done before, is that do we have any data on um, the rise uh, of violence against women and girls in Pakistan during COVID? I don't know if there's been any surveys done on it. I don't know if, um, there's, if there are any planned. I think it would be really useful to go to get that data insight first. And then um, also then following on from that is to think about what, what are the targeted interventions uh, that need to be made to ensure uh, that all women are able to access the services that they need. And I think what we then need to do is, as I said, you know, it's, it's really easy when I was doing, when I was doing advocacy work in the UK and when I was championing this work, you almost have to go in and think about how are you building allies? And I think most people want, are, are coming into this conversation um, with a desire to help. People want to fix this. Uh, people you know, want to ensure uh, that, I mean, I like to see the glass half full. Um, people want to make sure that all women have the opportunity. People want to make sure that um, women, women us are, um, are, are, are participating in society as in, in our, with, with all of our talents and our differences and, and, and whatnot. And so you have to think about how are you building those allies and that includes men as well. Um, so I think there was a conversation earlier on about some of the comments that we can get from allies. Digging deep, it's really important to dig deep, get beneath the service, uh, surface on why is it, um, if, if we're not able to build those ally networks, why is that the case and how can we actually bring them on board into this conversation? Thank you. And again, I, I totally agree that there is an intersectionality of class and gender and it's the working class people who are, and working class women who are most marginalized and vulnerable because A, they don't just face class exploitation, but they also face gender exploitation. And interestingly here, again, I, it might be a digression, but it's, it's an important point that I like to make here. So uh, traditionally it is assumed that if uh, labor force participation of women increase, that means empowerment. And right now, Pakistan has one of the lowest 
female labor force participation, i.e. how many women work formally. Well, every woman work, it is that we don't count that work that is done at home, i.e. the unpaid housework. So, and then the data shows again here, it's very preliminary. I and my co-author Shahram Azhar are looking at the labor force survey in Pakistan. And we see that the, the household work does not reduce substantially even when women go out and work, right? So the labor force uh, participation by women does not necessarily mean that uh, they are getting empowered. Of course, they may have more economic resources now, but they are subjected to uh, same level of household work and vulnerable to discrimination, not only at workplace, but also at house. So, so in that sense, again, Pakistan is a very interesting society and all of you understand this issue better than me. So in the, in the last round, I, I would uh, pose the following question that what, are, what is the way forward? So one, history tells us that women rights were not given by the policymakers. They were always fought through hard struggles, right? From the suffrage movement in the United States to the civil rights movement in the, in the US. So where we stand in Pakistan, there's some light, right? Some hope that there, there are new movements which centralize gender and class and in particular gender. So uh, are they, how do you see uh, what's the way forward and what are some positives that we can draw? So I think the way forward, uh, and Duba touched on this as well, is that it's, it's about a structural change, right? Um, and how do we bring about that structural change? Well, first, you need to change the perception of women and children in this country. What do I mean when I say that? Um, let's take the example. In a family, a child, um, what that child says, what that child's opinions are, how that child behaves, reflects on that family, right? Respect for that family. Similarly, women have the entire family's honor tied to their bodies, right? This is the problem with the perception of both women and children in this country. And it's important to recognize we didn't ask for this and that this is used as a tool of control. And here religion and um, harmful cultural practices and attitudes also have a role to play because we often use uh, religion and culture to justify domestic violence, uh, to oppose women-friendly laws, uh, particularly those that provide increased protection for women in cases of domestic violence or other forms of sexual violence. And three, you also have uh, misogyny embedded at the state level, where you have government office holders, police officers, actually endorsing and making comments which are misogynistic and which victim blame. So that culture also needs to change and there has to be zero tolerance for that sort of behavior and those sorts of comments. Uh, another thing that we really require, because it shouldn't just be after the fact, uh, but before, so you require at your school level, your intermediate level, your secondary level, compulsory gender sensitization courses. Um, you need uh, courses on sexual harassment and consent explaining to children, not just within a school setting or college setting or university setting, but also within their homes, they need to be taught about the importance of consent. Um, then you also need an environment where, because we know this is so prevalent, uh, victims have to be able to speak up. For as long as you have criminal defamation laws in your country, when women speak up about harassment and sexual violence, that's going to be very difficult. If you have men who are accused of sexual harassment filing uh, criminal defamation cases and, um, play, and effectively courts then placing gag orders on victims of sexual harassment, that becomes a very big problem and women are deterred from speaking out about their experiences. Uh, last, I think it's important to mention that we need um, not harsher penalties for GBV, but enforcement of existing penalties. So that certainty of punishment is very important. And at present, the conviction rate is less than 5% in these cases. And that's hugely problematic. And that again relates inherently to the mindset in the society, mindset prevalent among judges, prosecutors, lawyers, that women have no agency of their own. Thank you, Iman, and you raised some really great points about the, the legal structure and, and, and how the, 
the punishment is is not necessarily a corrective measure, right? You need to build incentives in society and change the norms that uh, reduce the patriarchy and misogyny. So moving on to Alina again, um, share your thoughts in terms of uh, the way forward and are there any positives that we can uh, get from what's going on in past few years in Pakistan? And if not, what are some concrete recommendations from you? Thank you, Danish. Uh, agreed, uh, couldn't agree more with Iman that, you know, there needs to be a structural change. And uh, stru for, for structural change, there needs to be change in social institutions, right? And uh, a good place to start in terms of social institutions would be our schools uh, and, and uh, universities would then be another sort of uh, social institution to tap into but schools more importantly because this the social conditioning of uh, these these gender norms these gender identities it starts from a very early age and uh, unless and until these these norms are challenged or or uh, you know debated at uh, at that age where uh, you know that conditioning is happening in the household uh, and in the schools, uh, you know the, the this cycle this vicious cycle of of uh, violence and inequality will only continue. So um, interestingly, uh, you know. In, in the wake of this uh, entire movement against uh, structural racism in, in the US, uh, we see a lot of uh, schools engaging parents in, in dialogues on structural uh, racism through parent, uh, using parent teacher meetings as, as, a, as an avenue for that. Uh, a parallel to that in Pakistan is our school management committees, which are frankly one of the most underutilized uh, structures and institutions that, that we have in place. And these school management committees could be used as, as an avenue to you know, not only uh, sort of um, engage the, the children and, and uh, the fraternity within uh, the school space, but also parents who you know are responsible for the other sort of major half of the social conditioning when it comes to gender norms uh, within children and starting these these conversations about uh, gender identities and and roles. Uh, similarly, in in universities, the, the first step would be to start a conversation to have that space uh, and, and dialogue on, on these uh, issues. Last uh, thing that I would you know, take this opportunity to highlight is representation of women in media. I think that is uh, another sort of important uh, pillar to this entire issue, which unfortunately only reinforces those negative stereotypes and those uh, negative practices of, of uh, whether that's misogyny or whether that's gender-based violence. And uh, the role of media is not only to de depict what is, but also what should be, what, what is the you know, ideal that we aspire for. So uh, you know, often when, when this sort of demand is, is made from media, you know, to represent more uh, empowered roles of, of women, the, the usual sort of comeback is, you know, we're just depicting what the reality is. But even within the reality, we do have empowered women, though few. Why, why are they not depicted as, as role models that young girls and young boys can aspire to? So that is another Thing that I would you know want to highlight in the way forward because these are the three most uh, accessible uh, solutions that that the state can at least work towards and and lastly building on to what Tuba said community engagement is is very very critical uh, a top-down approach uh, you know if, if it's not uh, 
it doesn't coincide with the with the bottom up approach which sort of empowers the, the stakeholders within the community it's it's not really going to work and neither is it sustainable Thank you, uh, Alina. Next, I'll, I'll move to Tuba with the with the same theme. Um, can you please share uh, insights based on your own experiences as a gender activist and as a political activist, and also as a gender theorist? Uh, how can we, as a society, make uh, gender-based movement right more hegemonic or popular across segments of society? Because because uh, at the moment it, it remains a very peripheral movement uh, to very specific groups of people who might subscribe to these ideas. So what are some potential ways we can make it more popular and appealing to wider segments of society? Thank you, Danish. <clears throat> I would I would just um, want to address first time with the question you asked the other panelists. I think uh, one of the gains we've made in the last few years is the rise of the feminist or women's movement, you can say. It is probably the first time that the private sphere has been politicized. The private sphere was not politicized before this, this kind of movement in the country. So bringing, you know, what, what I like, I like to use the term that bringing the private sphere to the city square is what the gender-based movement, or you can say the feminist movement has done. And I will, I will quote my mother who's, who wrote um, something about, about this, and it's, she, she's a poetess, and she said about the feminist movement, she said, So I think the women have come together and brought what they've been hiding even from themselves. We, the, the truth, the truth of our lives, whether it's it's women in the working class area or the middle class area or the so-called empowered women in this society. I think we have brought our pains, our wounds to the society to see. They're they're lying bare in the city squares every eighth March in the country. That what are, what is it that the women go through? And these these movements of rep are representative of a larger society. Um, I would I I also think that one reason why the movement has probably not penetrated deeply into the society is also because of the you know the weakening of the progressive or the leftist movement in the country. So as long as there's no working class politics. Um, it's very difficult to have a working class women's politics. So I, I, they go hand in hand. So I definitely think that one way is for the movement to either engage with the left or engage with the grassroots, um, you know, the people at the grassroots, the communities and going and approaching them. And I, I don't particularly think that it's only the middle class women uh, or upper middle class women who are empowered in this country. I, I've been inspired uh, to be a feminist or to be uh, the person I am from my working class grandmother, for example, uh, who used to, uh, you know, who used to take care of cattle. Uh, so I, I, I do, and she, she is the one who educated her entire family. She is the one who, who made me into a feminist. So I, I think we also need to um, get rid of this binary that empowerment is only of a certain kind or empowerment only comes uh, or, you know, you can say like it, it's only presented in the form of a woman like me. So I definitely think one very important thing for me is strengthening the working class movements in the country. We cannot bring about a transformational change through a feminist movement, which is not engaged with the working class movement, with the left movement, because those are the people who are actually more closely related to the men in the society. So just working with women, just like what Fosia said, I think because I don't, I don't work on policy, so I can't talk so much about that. But since I'm a grassroots activist, I can talk about what we need to do at that level. I think engaging, um, you know, making bridges between the feminist movement, the workers' movement, the trade unions' movement, and the students' movement is the way to go forward. And just like Alina spoke about colleges and students, I also happen to teach at the Gender Studies Department at Qaeda Azam University. And that's what we're do doing. Pakistan has so few, so few gender studies departments in the country. There's such little research being done that it's, it's you know, that is also one thing which is affecting us. And in our schools, we have a zero tolerance policy. So I also think we need to change that. We need to move from zero tolerance at our schools 
towards a transformational change and working together kind of principle. I think it's also working at early childhood. It's also working in, in, in the, you know, in the sphere of adult uh, education, which happens at university and also looking at it from a political perspective, taking it as a political issue, which can be addressed through political movements, to grassroots movements, because I think the change in the society cannot come from a law, cannot come from a policy. Uh, it can come from politicizing the realm, the private realm, and engaging with the feminist movement. I think it's 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 also part. It's a question of how the movement can do this and how the state can engage with the movement, which is barely happening at the moment. Great points, Tuba, and I, and I'd just like to add, like you know, feminism is uh, maybe a scary word for some in Pakistan. But one of my favorite scholars put it in the following way: feminism is the radical concept of seeing women as equal citizens and for some this is a very radical and maybe a western idea right so in in fact from a post-colonial perspective equating women empowerment to west is a colonial idea right it is the colonial rule which in in the south asia and in africa which conceptualized and then codified the natives as backward, right? This particular term is, is a colonial term, but we need to uh, come out of this colonial mindset and reconceptualize that woman empowerment or gender equality is as Pakistani idea as it is maybe American or British, right? So we, we don't let our agency to be, we, we don't want our agency to be denied here that it is only folks in the West who have a, who, who can be feminist, right? So, and with this, I'll, I'll come to Fozia. You have the last word here. And again, thank you for being here, but uh, anything you would like to add? Uh, thank you. Um, gosh, uh, what, a, what a privilege it has been to uh, spend the afternoon with you all. Um, two things that I will just, um, add um, and I should have shared with this uh, with you at the start, but actually Tuba's comments uh, just sort of sparked this in within me. So um, most people are um, fascinated to hear that both my parents can't read or write English, and yet somehow or another, by fortune uh, or by hard work, I don't know quite what it was, I ended up at Cam Cambridge University. And uh, when I look at my own story, when I look at my own parents. Um, for me, this goes back to uh, how, how the odds were stacked against me in the UK. You know, I was a woman of colour, I was uh, a Muslim, and, uh, you know, my, my parents were very, very working class uh, in the UK. And, and how was it that I was able to get to where I am today and to speak out against um, the issues that really matter to me personally? And that was because I had... Um, people who really believed in me. And I think it's really important that as women, as we're having this conversation today, we believe in ourselves and we build a really strong network of um, friends, allies that we can call upon, um, who can give us sound advice and who can also uh, open up uh, opportunities for us. And I guess this really matters for me in today's debate is because we should not be operating in silos. And, and today's conversation just highlights that, you know, we've got a lot in common. Uh, we might be sitting in different parts of the country, coming in from different uh, professions, but the one thing that's binding us together is a commitment to uh, stamp out violence against women and girls. So what I would love to see is how we can channel and um, bring together that energy uh, for the collective good. And the second thing that I would say is really to pay tribute to all the women, including my mom and uh, Tuba's grandmother and all the other women um, uh, uh, who've been, uh, including Danish, the women in your family. I was watching a film today, uh, yesterday actually, it was called uh, Misbehaviour, and it was a group of, I don't know if people have seen it, but it's a group of uh, feminists uh, in, in 1970s uh, Britain, and they were protesting against Miss World and, and, and the objectification of, of women. And um, I looked at that and I thought, wow, that was only 50 years ago. And, and you've mentioned the suffragette movement. We are here because those women uh, were powerful, they were courageous, they were dedicated, and they wanted to see change. And I think for us, 
we can't rely upon anyone else. I always think this personally, we can't rely upon anyone else to say, okay, uh, make this change happen. For me, uh, the best quote that I always use is, uh, be the change that you want to see. And that means that we all have a responsibility to try, to try and make a difference, uh, not just for ourselves, but for our future generations as well. So hopefully, um, uh, I don't know if this will happen in my own lifetime, but at some point, uh, we won't be having this, top, this conversation anymore. That's it from me. Thank you. And, and, and also like uh, Iman and Alina to pay tribute to whoever they feel uh, is instrumental in their lives as Hosea and Tuba has done. Well, I think definitely I am uh, inspired by the uh, courage and the uh, independence of my mother, uh, as I am by lots of other feminist icons in this country, including Asma Jangir, Hina Jilani, uh, and then people closer to my age group. There's so many wonderful women doing so much um, incredible and difficult work. For example, Nigat Dad, who runs the Digital Rights Foundation. So there's many, many women, and I think uh, I would not stop talking if I started. <laughs> I think it's the same case for me. Uh, if I had to jot down all the names, it would be a very long Excel sheet. Uh, I'm privileged to be to know, uh, you know, enough uh, inspiring women in my own circle who, you know, continue to inspire me with the amazing work that they're doing in different uh, fields. But yeah, it, it has to be uh, the, the, the top of the list uh, has to be my mother, uh, who's, who's been an inspiration. Right, great. Thank you all. And it, it was a wonderful talking to all of you. And it really helped my own understanding of the issue. And, uh, and I, I call myself a feminist economist, but again, the lived experience that uh, women of Pakistan have, which I can never experience, right? So, and, and that's where um, it's, it's really important to hear a woman's thoughts and how they conceptualize gender discrimination in that country. So, and hopefully we can continue to, to do this more often. And once again, thank you to all of you and we hope to stay in touch. Thank you. Mm -hmm.